By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today it is Tuesday and that means we're back at the Wizards Cup. So this tournament, in case you haven't followed any of the prior matches, this tournament is pretty unique. Uh, the contenders had to build decks consisting out of the Dark, Fallen Empires and Homelands only. Those were the only three expansions that they could brew with. And we've reached the final four. We're now at the semi-finals. If you would like to know more about this tournament, by the way, it is quite easy. In the description below, there's a link to the tournament website with all the rules, the ban and restricted list, and a lot, a lot of really, really cool deck photos. So if you like this format, have a look. And you know what? Maybe you can organize your own Wizards Cup. In the semi-finals, in this episode, we're going to look at Alex who is uh, playing with a dominantly white deck, but he's also playing some red. He's playing a deck called Defend Ikeja at all cost, white soldier deck mainly with some red burn in it. And he is playing against Brian, and Brian, he really likes the dark, I guess, because his deck is mainly built up out of the dark cards. It's black and it's green and it's called Kill Em All. <laughs> I, I like the title and uh, it's actually named after a Metallica album, but I'm going to talk more about that in the deck tech section that I'm going to start in a moment talking about that. I know that some of you enjoy uh, going to the games instantly, skipping the deck tech. You can do that like always by checking the description below and there you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. If you click on there, it will take you directly to the games. And here we are going to continue with the deck tech and I'm going to start with the deck of Alex white and red defend Ikeja at all cost. Let's take a look. And here we see the deck of Alex. So it's white and it's red. And there are also a lot of artifacts actually in this deck right there in the middle. So I think when I'm looking at this deck, his main strategy is just to play out a lot of smaller kind of soldiers and knights. So I see a uh, full place of Ikeshian Javelineers. That's a pretty strong creature from Fallen Empires. A 1-1 one, one for 1 that comes into play with a Javelin counter on it and then you can tap it and then you take the counter off and you can deal one damage to any target. So basically what this creature does is it can trade, right? It can kill probably a 1-1 of your opponent and then you have a 1-1 left. So it's a good deal for you. It's also great for combat tricks like this. This creature is way better than you might think when you see it at first glance. Now, um, there's also an interesting Homelands card in his White Army, a, a card that I think could play a pretty big role, and that's Abby Gargoyle. Now, Abby Gargoyle is a 3-4 creature, which is actually pretty beefy in this format. It's got flying, it's 3 white and 2 to cast, um, and it's got protection from red. Now, the protection from red is not going to be very relevant because his opponent, uh, Brian, is playing with uh, green and with black today. But what is going to be relevant is the fact that this creature is flying. Brian has no flying creatures in his deck. So I think the Abbey Gargoyle, if he can get that card quick enough during the game, it can be quite powerful. And he can actually use his Zellion Sword on the Gargoyle as well. He has a single copy of Zellion Sword in his deck. And it's basically one of the first equipment cards. It's three to cast. And then you can pay, I believe, three again and tap it. Um, and then it gives target creature plus two plus O, oh, and then you can choose to keep that artifact tapped and then it remains giving that bonus to that specific creature. Of course, you can also choose to untap it again during your untap phase. That's completely up to you, but you can keep it tapped and that's kind of what gives it that um, equipment um, kind of feel to it. Then another flyer in this deck is the uh, Rotro Thopter, I believe it's called. It's kind of the Ornithopter of Homelands. It's one to cast, it's an O2 creature, it's flying. It's actually pretty bad. You can pay two and give it plus one plus O, but you can only do that twice. So for four mana, you gotta invest four mana in it, and then you've got a two-two flyer. I think what makes this card good is the fact that we're playing either Dark's Fallen Empire Homelands format only. That's why this card is actually useful. The fact that again his opponent doesn't have any flying makes it useful. I do think it is a little vulnerable though with only two toughness. Remember, um, in this format you can play with AO piles. You also see Alex playing with four AO piles and I'm pretty sure Brian does too. An AO pile, two to cast and then um, you can pay one in second and it deals two damage to any target. So kind of AO pile, you could see that as the lightning bolt of this format. So you really got to look at your creatures and think, okay, is this AO pileable? Like what you would normally do with, with lightning bolt, right? You would say Juggernaut, because it's got a toughness three, 
it is vulnerable to a lightning bolt, so it's not as great of a card as it could be if it would have had a higher toughness, right? The same can be said for a card like Pirate Ship. And in this format, AO Pile is kind of that standard. So you're constantly looking at, are there any cards with the toughness higher than two? Because that really makes the card a lot better. Like, for example, the Abbey Gargoyle, but also the Clockwork Steed and the Clockwork Swarm, the two other arti the artifact creatures that are in this deck. Now, if we look at the red section, it is, it is pretty um, interesting because yeah, he's, he's only chosen to go for basically uh, removal spells in his whole red section, right? We, we see a single Dwarven Catapult, which I think is a really good card, kind of underestimated because it's an instant. Uh, basically what it does, right, um, one red and X, it's kind of the, fall, the Fallen Empire Fireball, and uh, you can play it, and then you can deal X damage amount uh, divided equally over the creatures of your opponent. So you cannot divide it, just divide it equally. So if you would play Dwarven Catapult for four and your opponent has four creatures, it deals one damage to each creature. But remember, it's instant speed. And that's what I think is so good about this card. You can play it during combat. Um, you know, you can play it in the turn of your opponent. It is, it is again, a card that's when you play with it, you realize how powerful instant speed is. Talking about instant speed, there are also two Fishers in this deck, again, Instant speed, um, very powerful. Fisher, two red and three to cast. The problem, of course, of this card from the dark is that it's a little bit too expensive. If, if it would have been cheaper, you would have seen it in every old school deck. I'm convinced about that because this is one of those cards, just like a disenchant, it gives you options. With disenchant, you can choose, of course, enchantment or artifact. Fisher is kind of the red disenchant in that regard because you have an option as well. You can destroy a land or you can bury a creature, right? And the interesting thing about burying then the creature cannot be regenerated. So that can actually be relevant in specific matchups. So Fisher is in here. Then we also have a really nice sweeper. We've got two Inferno. So Inferno, that's six damage to everything. And then again, I'm just gonna zoom in um, to some of those uh, Homeland cards. And you might wonder, why does he do that? Well, because Homelands, you don't see it in action that often. So I kind of feel that, um, yeah, I kind of wanna show you a few cards that you recognize that when we're actually looking at the match. And what I'd like to look at is this art, Iron Claw Curse. Look at it. <laughs> I mean, wow. Dennis Detwiller uh, is the artist. Dennis, I don't know what artwork work you've done. Maybe I should look at it, but wow, man, this is really, this is strong art. This really comes in when I'm looking at it. That guy is feeling extremely uncomfortable. And I guess that's the uh, Iron Claw that's holding him there, that curse. And what this card does is target creature get minus minus O minus one, and that creature cannot be assigned to block any creature with power greater than or equal to the toughness of the creature Iron Curse uh, enchant. So it can kind of take out a blocker, and it can also kind of be removal. And again, if you combine Iron Claw Curse uh, in combination with, for example, the Acacian Javelinier or the Aeo Pile, all of a sudden you can kill you know bigger creatures thanks to the Iron Claw Curse. So I think this is an interesting card. I'm kind of looking forward to see how good Iron Claw Curse actually is. Is it just, you know, really bad removal? Or is it actually one of those cards that's more powerful than you expect and more useful than you expect? So that's something that I'm looking forward to. It's something I'm I'm gonna look at um, in this matchup. Okay, so this is the deck of Alex. There are definitely a few other cards that I could have discussed, but I'm just gonna keep it at this. This is the deck. And now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Brian, the black and green brew, kill them all. And here we see the deck of Brian, black and green, kill them all. And actually the title, official title of the deck is a little bit longer. So I'm just going to read it out to you, but I couldn't fit it on, on the screen. It's kill them all and let Autumn Willow sort them out. That is the official title. And we've got that beautiful uh, Metallica album in the middle of the deck photo. I just think it's uh, it's a hilarious, uh, hilarious little deck photo. I really like it. And what we see here is this black-green uh, combination that can actually be pretty strong because it can do two things. It can uh, play a lot of beefy creatures. So we're seeing, um, you know, Giant Slug. Uh, sorry, we're seeing Spitting Slug, not the Giant Slug. That's another card, but we're seeing Spitting Slug, the 2-4 for 3. We're seeing Worm of Tree Folk, uh, the 4-4 four, four for 5. And of course, we saw we see Autumn Willow, uh, a 2, a green, and 4 for a 4-4. Four, four that can actually not be targeted at all, which which makes it really, really strong. And this was one of the first cards that had that Shroud ability. So pretty unique. Um, and really a card that I remember when Homelands came out, really a card um, where everybody was 
that everybody was excited about, together with Baron Sangir and a few other cards, but mainly Autumn Willow and Baron Sangir, they, they were the two like considered most powerful cards of that expansion. Now, um, the interesting thing here is that, so besides the beef of green, the other powerful thing about this combination is the removal power, the destructional power of black. So we see four ashes to ashes in this deck, two black and one to cast, uh, beautiful art by Drew Tucker, by the way, and ashes to ashes removes two target creatures from the game and then deals five damage to you. So, I mean, you do get five damage, but for those five life, you get to remove two creatures from the game. I think that is absolutely huge. And an interesting thing here is uh, that he's not only playing with four Ashes to Ashes, he's also playing with three Torture. And Torture, it's such an interesting card. You one black to cast Enchant Creature, and um, then you can pay one black and one to, to really literally torture a creature, because when you do that, you put a minus one, minus one counter on that creature. So you can, with Torture, you can slowly kill a creature. So you weaken it and you slowly kill it. Now there's an interesting synergy between Torture and another card in this deck. And that card is Tracker. So Tracker is one green and two to cast for a two two from the dark. And this card is actually the first card that has the mechanic that we now call fight on it. So what it does, you pay two green and two and then Tracker does an amount of damage equal to its power to target creature, but it also gets damage back equal to the power of the creature it's targeting. For example, if Tracker targets a 1-1 one, one creature, it deals 2 damage to the creature and it gets 1 damage back, right? So Tracker lives. But Tracker is pretty small. It only, it only has a toughness of 2, so as soon as it um, targets a 2-2 two, two creature, it basically trades, right? So that's not great. The cool thing is, though, when you're playing Torture, you can slowly make your opponent's creature small enough and as soon as it's got uh, one power you can start attacking it with the tracker and the tracker lives. Another cool thing about this synergy is that you can also incorporate Funeral, funeral March in this Funeral March, another card from Homelands, two black and one to cast and um, you know this card it's, it's pretty unique uh, because Funeral March reads when the creature in chance dies, so when target creature leaves play, that creature's controller sacrifices a creature he or she controls. Ignore this effect if that player controls no creatures, right? So basically it's a two for one. You kill the creature that enchants Funeral March, and then your opponent also has to sacrifice another creature. So again, there's some cool synergy in here. Talking about synergies, we also see Thrall Retainer in this deck. One black card from uh, Fallen Empires. I think this card, again, is a little bit underestimated. It's a pretty cool card. It gives target creature plus one, plus one. And more importantly, you can sacrifice the Thrall Retainer to give um, to regenerate a creature. So basically what um, Brian can do is he can put a um, Thrall Retainer on the tracker, making it a 3-3, three, three, then destroy another 3-3. Three, three. That would mean that the tracker would die, right? Because it gets three damage back. But Brian can then simply sacrifice a Thrall Retainer to keep it alive. So there are a lot of tricks in this deck with the Tracker. So I'm really going to look out for that. I'm hoping that Brian will be able to get a Tracker on the table and do a lot of these little tricks. Another card that I really would like to point out is Skull of Arm. So Skull of Arm, uh, of Orm, I should say, Skull of Orm, a card from the dark for three to cast, uh, an artifact. And what you can do with this card, five and tap, and it brings an enchantment back from your graveyard to your hand. Now, usually you would think it's five to activate. I mean, this is way too expensive. We're probably not going to see this card in action. But I'm, I've seen these games. I know these games. And these games can go long. They don't always. You've got quick games, but they can go long. And if they go long, I think Skull of Orm can play a vital role, role in giving Brian the victory. The last card I want to point out, and then we're definitely ready to go for the matches, is Dark Heart of the Wood. So Dark Heart of the Wood, one green and one black. It's a pretty unique enchantment, and it reads you a sacrifice of force to gain three life. Now you're probably thinking, why? I mean, why would you sacrifice one of your lands to gain three life? But think with me here. What if you're in mid game? What if you're in late game? You've already got lots and lots of lands. You've got enough lands. You don't need more lands. Then you can start sacrificing them to gain life and give yourself some space to cast those Ashes to Ashes. So Dark Art of the Woods is kind of your entry ticket to cast those Ashes to Ashes later in the game. So it's important uh, to this deck, I think. So that's some, something else I'm really going to watch in this match. Wow, there's actually quite a lot to, to be excited about and to kind of watch out for for in this in the semifinals. Talking about that, let's go to the game. So get ready. First semifinals of the Wizards Cup. Here we go. 
Game number one, Alexander on the left with his white and red deck against Brian on the right with his black and green deck. There we see a basic planes passing turn. So this is the semi finals. The winner will advance to the finals. There's an AO pile turn two. And will we, oh, also an AO pile from Brian here. This is one of the, I guess, most played cards in the tournament. I think most decks had four AO piles in them. I played with three main and one in the sideboard. There we see another planes from Alex, by the way. And there is a Feral Zealot. That's a card we didn't discuss yet. It's a 2-2 creature. And when it's not blocked, you can choose to deal three damage to any target instead of uh, dealing damage uh, to the opponent. And there we see a torture being played on it. So it's now a, yeah, it's now a 1-1. One, one. There is a torture counter being placed on it. That means one damage for Brian. And ooh, there's a Clockwork Steed. Clockwork Steed, actually pretty strong. It's a 4-3 for four, 4, which are pretty decent stats. There is another torture. Oh, man. And here we can see that power by Brian. All that blackness is really focused on just killing the creatures. And I think if he's going to attack here with the Clockwork Steed, he's going to place Torture Counter on it and kill it with the AO Pile. Let's see if that's actually what's going to happen. Yeah, there we see a Torture Counter on the Steed and the AO Pile. That means the Clockwork Steed is history. Another point of damage though for Brian. So we see some more aggression here from Alex. Not an Abbey Gargoyle, by the way, for Alex. There is a Dark Heart of the Wood. Only one force to play for Brian, so I don't think he's gonna sack that. There is another attack, but there is a torture activation. Zealot is also gone, and a pass turn here. Probably Alex has some type kind of removal in hand, but there are no creatures yet from Brian. Okay, there we see a knight. That's a 2-2 banner protection from red. And there is a spitting slug with a thrall retainer. So that's now a 3-5 creature. So that is too big for the knight to deal with. The knight is just a 2-2 on its own. And banding is really good, but it is good when you've got multiple creatures on the board. In this case, he does not. And even with the damage from the AO pile, he cannot get rid of the spitting slug. Ooh, I like this. There's the Inferno. And the cool thing is the Inferno uh, is red and the Knights is pro-red. So it's a, some really nice synergy here in the deck of Alex. And uh, we see the Spitting Slug live because Brian sacrificed his Throw Retainer. And when you sack it, you can regenerate the creature in chance. And uh, there we see another Spitting Slug hitting the board. It looks like Brian is kind of taking over this duel. There we also see a Skull of Orm hitting the board. And he's empty-handed, he's pointing that out. But look at his graveyard, there are tons and tons of enchantments in there. Oh, what are we going to see? Another Inferno! Wow, this is huge. This is huge. And now he's attacking. We can see the life total of Brian really taking a hit here, going to four. And now he's got to activate five, probably getting back a Torture, I guess? playing a torture out, but he doesn't have enough mana to activate it yet. So it's still a 2-2. Remember, he needs one black and one to commit to put a minus one, minus one counter on the knight. He doesn't have that mana. He's going to drop to two. I mean, things are looking bad here for Brian, although Alex himself is on six. Wait a minute. He's got the AO pile. If he uses the AO pile or not. And of course, then he can sack. So he's using the AO pile. In response, Brian is sacking, gaining three life, losing two. So going up a life. He's now on three. So the only thing that's keeping him alive here is uh, the Dark Heart of the Wood. And he doesn't want to sack too many forts. Only has two left. And that Ring of Renewal is going to do some business as well. Ring of Renewal, you can uh, pay five and tap. That's what he's doing now. Then you've got to discard a card and draw a card. But if you've got no cards in hand, you can simply just draw two cards for five, which is really, really good from Ring of Renewal. There we see another AO pile, and he's activating it. And that means... Or is he not activating it? Kind of missed what happened there. Looks like Brian is still sitting on three and Alex is on six. Using the skull again, getting the torture back, putting the torture on one of the javelineers, activating it so it's dead and it's got summoning sickness still. So that means that Alex cannot use it to, uh, to ping Brian for one. And look at that, using the AO pile. So now Brian is dropping to one. Remember, he can still sack a force to gain three attacking with the javelineers and Brian has to sack 
Going to four, then taking damage, going back to three. There we see another Javelin here, and I think that means that Brian is forced to again use the Skull. And here we can really see the power of the Ring of Renewal. Ring of Renewal is really taking over this game. It's probably going to give the victory here to Alex. That and, of course, those Infernos that were really great, especially that sweep of Spitting Slugs. Yeah, that's it. That is the first game. Wow, there was a point in this game where I really felt that Brian was going to take this first one. Now, both players are going to dive deep into their sideboards and then we're gonna uh, we're gonna catch back up with them in game number two when they're done with their sideboarding business. Game number two. Okay, here we go. So it's one up for Alex, and uh, Brent, that means Brian is on the play. Brian already started here with a basic force. There we see Cajun Javel nearby. Alex, pretty good a one drop here. And there we see an AO pile, and he's gonna attack. So he's gonna go to 19. I wonder now if Brian's gonna use the AO pile next turn. Must be pretty tempting because Alexander cannot like tap the Javelinier in response. Uh, okay, he's playing Skull of Arm instead. Chooses to keep the AO pile around. Gonna drop to 18 here. Of course, the downside of the Skull is it's three to cast, but five to use. I'm always a bigger fan when it's the other way around, when it's more expensive to cast and then cheaper to use. For example, like Icy Manipulator, it's four to cast, one to use. And now he's got five, but no enchantments in the bin. Ooh, what's what's in Brian's hand? Doesn't look like a very good draw for him, but look at Alex, he's not finding any red sources. We do know that all his creatures are white though, so it doesn't have to be a big problem. There we see Knights of Thorn again. And Ashes to Ashes, that is pretty sweet here for Brian. He was probably waiting for Alex to play that second creature out. Now remember, Brian plays with a full play set of Ashes to Ashes, so it's not surprising that we see it um, you know, in the hand of, of Brian. There is another Knights though, the 2-2 Bander Pro Red. And we saw that neat little Inferno trick already in uh, in game number one. Oh wow, look at this. Miss Willow is making her appearance. Autumn Willow, the 4-4. So it cannot be targeted by spells or effects. And then if Brian pays one green, he can actually target it. Yeah, he's gonna have some more wine here. <laughs> Try to get some inspiration for this game because he's a little bit under pressure. There we see the Abbey Gargoyle, a 3-4 flyer, and that flying is going to be a huge problem for Brian. We talked about that already in the deck deck. Look at this Thrall Retainer. The bad thing, though, is if he attacks with it, yeah, okay, I guess he should, but he can expect something on the swing deck. Oh, look at that abandoning. And he's going to use the AO pile to deal damage to the Knights in response to the band. And yeah, so he chose to block in the band. In response, he destroys the knights, exactly. And then he can kill the Abbey Gargoyle. That was some good play from Brian here. And I guess Alex kind of overlooked that AO pile. There's another Abbey Gargoyle though. But now kind of Brian is able to deal pressure, right? Attacking with the 5-5, Alex dropping to 15. There's the Maze of If. Wow, that Maze of If is pretty brilliant. He can use Maze to Maze the Gargoyle, so he can just attack without having to take damage on the drawback. There we see the Thopter, and there's a Zillion Sword. So I guess next turn with the Zillion Sword, he can pump the Gargoyle, and then he can block the Autumn Willow, and they would trade, but the Autumn Willow has a Thrall Retainer on it, so Brian can actually sack the Retainer, regenerate the Autumn Willow. And remember, he can use Skull of Arm to get the... Um, Throw retainer back into into uh, into his hand, so it's quite nice what he's got here. He just has to swing in, right? And of course, Alex doesn't have any red, so that means that he doesn't have any removal probably, because almost all his removal, I guess, all his removal except for the AO piles are red. So no dwarven catapults, no fissures. Then again, that doesn't really matter, does it? Because he can't even target Autumn Willow. I guess what he needs is an Inferno. But if he gets, he's already on 10. If he gets low enough, he can't even cast the Inferno anymore. We see Alex really stuck here, not finding the red. Okay, putting the sword on the Thopter. So Thopter is now a 2-2, attacking him for 5. So maybe he's kind of hoping to win it. Yeah, of course, he's got the mace still, Brian. So I guess this is not really going to help him. I mean, he's going to deal 2 damage. If he wants, he can pump it for another power, but it's going to cost him both of his mana, though. I don't know if he wants to do that. 
No, he doesn't want to do that. Playing another Thopter. Maybe he's going to chump the Autumn Willow. That's, of course, an option as well. That's going to save him some damage. He's on 10 right now. He's probably... I mean, he wants to say... To stay, you know... He wants to have more life than 6. Because he still wants to be able to cast Inferno, I guess. There we see a Funeral March. Oh, this is interesting. He's probably going to cast a Funeral March on the Thopter. And now he's going to attack. Now it's going to be harder for Alexander to chum block with that Thopter. Remember, when the creature uh, enchanted by Funeral March dies, uh, the opponent has to sacrifice another creature. So basically, when he chum blocks with it, the other creature dies. So I think he's untapped the Zeleon Sword. That would make sense. And probably equip it on the other Thopter. Maybe the Thopter with... Okay, now he's going to keep it. He's going to keep it tapped. So he's going to keep it a 2-2. Remember, it does cost three then to like give the bonus to another creature again. So that's pretty mana heavy, I guess. It's gonna attack with two. This is interesting. No damage taken. He's not gonna pump them. So the maze is used on the two two. What is he gonna do here? Tapping. No, untapping again. So he's really. In the tank here, he's trying to find a way out. Remember, you cannot target Autumn Willow. And there's another Abbey Gargoyle. So he is drawing tons of Abbey Gargoyles, but because of the pressure of Brian and that earlier, you know, kind of mistake with the block with the banding situation, um, it's just not giving him the victory. Attacking it, maybe he's going to jump here or going to... He can double block, I guess. But then Brian will just use the Thrall Retainer to regenerate and get it back with the skull. So I think if I was in the shoes of Alex, Alex right now, which is not great, I would probably just jump with the Thopter, with the 2-2 Thopter. We can see him think he's actually jumping with the Abbey Gargoyle. Interesting, because Abbey Gargoyle is bigger, right? I wonder why he would do that. Finding, Finally finding a red source, probably too little too late, but he's finding one. Thopter being sent back again. So now he's going to pump the Thopter. Now he's on seven. Ooh, I'm sure Brian knows this is risky. Seven is almost six. Attacking here is going to drop to five. And why is it such an interesting number six? Because of that Inferno. If Alex can find a second mountain, and if he has an Inferno in hand, with the AO pile together, he can kind of get a draw out of this game. And that's kind of winning it in my book, to be honest, because he's really behind on this one. If he can get a second mountain, and he can use his AO pile to deal two damage to Brian, and then cast the Inferno, this is going to be a draw. Looking at his hand. Doesn't look like he's got a second mountain, though, or else he would have played it out. Are we going to see a third game? It looks like it because he's passing turn. Maybe he's got a Dwarven Catapult in hand, but remember, he cannot target Autumn Willow. That is the problem here. He's not dead yet. He can still chump. There's another Thrall Retainer. So that Wormwood Tree Folk is now a 5-5. I'm really liking these, these Thrall Retainers. They're very impressive. They're really doing a great job. I mean, they're keeping the creatures alive. They're pumping the creatures up. And here we see the double block. He kind of has to. This, you don't want to do this, right? This is bad news for Alex, but he has to. It's this or die. Using the AO pile on the life total of Brian. Brian dropping to five. Can he find... No, no mountain. Only in... Oh, it wasn't his hand. He had two Infernos in hand. Oh, you were so close to a tie here, Alex. But um, I'm actually happy because this means we're going to see a third game. But wow. Wow, you were close, man. Um, so yeah, let's let's go to game three. Let's go to the deciding the last game. Who's gonna make it to the finals of the Wizards Cup? Game number three. This is it. The winner of this game will go to the finals of the Wizards Cup. Whoa! Remember, we started with was it thirty four or thirty five players? There were a lot. First, you had to uh, to make it to the top two of your group. Then you had to play a top 16, top 8, now the semifinals. And then to get that title to win the Wizards Cup, there's just one more final match. But first, this game, it's going to be Brian or it's going to be Alex. I must say, I mean, both of these decks, they're strong. They, they both have their own little 
strengths and uh, and weaknesses. And I'm really, I really don't know. I really couldn't tell you who's going to make it uh, here to the finals. We do see Brian really taking his time to shuffle up his deck. I mean, I, I don't blame him. His kill him all deck and let Autumn Willow do the rest. That's kind of what happened actually in game number two. Autumn Willow did great work. And I must say those Thrall Retainers, they're, they're good. They're good little, little handy little cards. I always like it when a card basically does two things. Wow, even some more shuffling here from Brian. And Alex is going to reset the life totals here. And we can see Alex has a nice Quebec playmat. He's from Canada himself. And uh, Brian is from the States. So we're going to see a North American in the Wizards Cup final no matter what. And in that final, they're actually going to play against... Um, against Rob, who's playing with a Dwarven Tribal deck. And it's also a red and white deck, by the way. So it could be... Uh, oh no, that's actually Mono Red. So it could be Mono Red against White Red of Alex. Or it could be uh, the Mono Red deck of Rob against the, uh, the Black and Green deck of Brian. And Rob is a player from the Netherlands. Okay, it looks like here we go. Are the players going to keep their hand in this decisive third game? Or are they going to take a mulligan? Alex looking at his hand again. He's not quite sure. Okay, he's starting. Going off. Wow, a card from the sideboard. This is Deaf Speakers. It's a 1-1 Pro Black. And uh, he's swinging in here. And playing another or another. He's playing a Thopter, the first Thopter, the 0-2 Flyer that we saw in game number two. There we see a Dark Heart of the Wood from Brian. Not very relevant. Could be relevant later in the game, though. He can swing in here if he wants to pump the Thopter. Just swing in with the speakers, playing a Zeleon Sword. The card he can give plus uh, 2, plus 0. Oh. There is a Spitting Slug. Spitting Slug is just so big. You get so much value, you know. 3 and you get a 2, 4. It's huge. And now kind of the Deaf Speaker cannot attack anymore, I guess. Okay, there we see the Clockwork Steed, a 4-3 creature. Could have chosen as well, Alex, to attack with the Thopter and pump it with the sword, for example. Chose to cast the horse instead. Kind of makes sense, I guess. Oh, there we see that Thrall Retainer. Those retainers are just so good. Brian choosing not to attack, realizing that if he does, he opens himself up for a lot of pain coming from Alex with all those creatures. Using the sword here on the Thopter, gonna swing in. Dealing two damage here to Brian. Gonna drop to 18. First damage, or 16, of course, because the Death Speakers also did some damage earlier in the match. So Brian's going to go to 16, playing a Force. Those Force are actually kind of relevant because of the Dark Heart, but he's kind of missing a second Swamp. So he's playing Wormwood Tree Folk. It's a 4-4. Four, four. You can give it Force Walk and Swamp Walk. Unfortunately for Brian, Alex doesn't play with those lands. But still, it's pretty big, a 4-4. Four, four. And then he can consider actually attacking with the Wormwood Tree Folk. Next turn, or maybe uh, with the Spitting Slug. Or both, who knows. First, it's Alex who's up. He's got five lands, three planes, two mountains. It's actually enough to cast an Abbey Gargoyle, which would be kind of nice for him if he could draw into one. Attacking again. Haven't seen a Tracker, by the way. I talked a lot about the card Tracker in the deck deck, but unfortunately, Brian hasn't been able to cast one. I was really looking forward to see some uh, Tracker action. The attack from the Thopter here, by the way, Brian dropping to 14. There we see an AO pile from Brian. So he can actually take out the Thopter if he wants to. Fisher, ooh. Remember, it buries a creature. So that means that Brian cannot use the Throw Retainer to regenerate it. So Fisher is a great card, great play to get rid of that Slug. And uh, it looks like, yeah, is he going now going to attack with both the Steed and the Thopter, yes, that's exactly what it's going to do. Now remember, Clockwork Steed is a clockwork, so that means that every time it attacks, it loses a counter. So this means it deals four damage, and then it's going to lose a counter. So it should go down to 3-3, three, three, from 4-3 to 3-3, three, three, I believe. Yeah, that's exactly what Alex is doing. Now passing turn here, and we saw the Thopter getting killed by the AO pile. There we see Autumn Willow, 4-4 four, four creature. There's the attack. And look at this. Interesting. He's going to block. Remember, 
Brian actually doesn't play with any black creatures. So he only plays with black removal. He's going to swing in with the flyer, I assume, or not. Yeah, he's going to swing in here with the flyer. He's going to go to seven. Oh, he's so low. Ooh, play the Knights. The Knights is banding. He can start blocking in the band next turn. Now, do remember, Brian has a Dark Heart of the Wood and a lot of force. Each force now represents three life. He can sack a force for three. So he's not dead yet. He's still very much in this game, actually. He's going to play a Serrated Arrows. It's a card that's restricted because he's just so powerful. Three Arrowhead counters. If he taps it, he can put a minus one, minus one counter on a creature of choice. And he can do that three times for the three Arrowhead counters on that artifact. And there he's going to use the sword on the Gargoyle. So the Gargoyle is now a 5-4 flyer. Look at the life total of Brian. Oh man, he's dropping to 2 here. And look at that life total of Alex. He's still on 20. There's just been a lot of pressure. Those flyers are a problem. Funeral March, of course, being played on the Knights. Killing the Knights. Here's some nice synergy from Brian. Now he's got to sack another creature. Probably going to sack the Steed. But if he does, it means they're going to take tons and tons of damage. You're going to take 8, I guess. I do think it's probably the best decision. Yeah, he's going to sack the Steed because of that Funeral March. He's going to take 8, going to drop to 12. Ooh, we really have a game on our hands here. 12 against 2, but the Dark Heart of the Wood is probably what's going to keep, what's going to keep Brian alive and maybe give... Give him the time he needs to still win this one. There we see the Knights again. 2-2 two, two Bander. He's probably not going to attack, right? Okay, playing Ao Pile and passing turns. I think at least he's tapped out. I always like it when my opponent stepped out, you know? It kind of gives me an oversight. I don't have to worry about him playing any spells. So Brian, two cards in hand. Alex, one card in hand. Is he going to attack? Going to attack with the Autumn Willow. Going to block in a band here. Autumn Willow dies. And this is interesting that he's actually letting the Autumn Willow die or did it have a minus one, minus one counter on Because what he could have done, because they block in a band, is put one damage on the Knight and three damage on the Gargoyle. Oh, but then he could have used his serrated arrows, of course. Now I understand. So that's a good decision by Alex, actually. Now attacking here forcing Brian to sacrifice a forest to stay alive. He's now on one measly life. Also has that AO pile, but the problem is Alex doesn't have a blocker, so now he's going to take eight damage. He's going to drop to four. Oh, Inferno! That is huge. That is huge. And you're probably thinking, why isn't Abby Gargoyle dying? Well, Abby Gargoyle is pro-red. That's actually something I didn't discuss in the deck deck, but that's quite brilliant. The Knights are pro-red, the Abbey Gargoyle is pro-red, and then with Inferno, you know, they don't take the damage from the Inferno. So, Brian now starting to sack forests. I don't think he's going to actually win this one. I think this Inferno was the big decider. Just like in Game 2, or sorry, in Game 1, um, Game 3 is now also decided on the Inferno, and that's it, you know. Brian is saying, this is it, man. This is all I can do. Congratulations, Alex. You will be going on to the finals of the Wizards Cup where you will have to duel against Dwarven Tribal. And it's really like I've seen that deck in action. It's good. Talking about seeing decks in action. If you enjoyed this tournament, um, check the description below. Check the channel. I think there are links to the playlist of the Wizards Cup. And you can look back at all the goofy, tour uh, all the goofy games and plays that were made um, in this unique tournament and also you can find a link to the tournament website in the description below so if you like what you're seeing you want to know more about this tournament maybe organize a wizard's cup yourself you can find the information in the description below it's really really interesting um talking about all that uh, this was the episode for today for the tuesday thank you very much for tuning in right here on timmy talks now if you want to support the channel you can do that by leaving a like, leaving a comment, or subscribe if you're not a sub yet. Another thing you can uh, that you can do is become a sponsor of the show. You can become a patron by connecting with us through Patreon. And if you're interested in that, it already starts with a dollar a month. You can click on the info card that's appearing right now. And the cool thing is, if you become a patron of the channel, do you know what happens? 
Your name will be in the end scroll. How cool is that? Talking about cool. Let's take a look at our amazing, fantastic, wunderbar patrons and channel members of Timmy Talks. Let's go to the end scroll. Ik het was fikkertes, somba kazik. 